What's up, guys? Welcome back to U.S. History. Got some notes for you today. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it brief. Man, I'm trying to find a spot for me to put this picture here. Uh, <laughs> get my ugly mug out of your way. Okay, hitting three basic topics today, all apply into the 1920s. So you should have already started your Roaring Twenties page of notes. If you haven't already done that, you probably want to go back to the last lectures over this week. I think Miss Wilkins kicked it off with an initial like 1920s lecture where she summed up a lot of things. Some of the things that I'm hitting will be a little bit of recap. Uh, might be explained slightly different, but just so you know, she is done. I think it is t today is her last day where she's now graduating from Central Michigan. So you're really not going to see much more of her. It'll all kind of be from uh, me from here on out. <clears throat> Um, I wanted to recap some of this stuff, even if it is like repetition for you, know that what I'm giving you on this is what I would put on the exam or any upcoming assignments, quizzes, etc. that kind of stuff. So have your Roaring Twenties page of notes out. Uh, you should have had stuff on women yesterday. I, I believe Miss uh, Wilkins gave you some notes over the Scopes trial, kind of that conflict between religion, like, you know, teaching evolution or the Bible in public schools. Uh, today we're going to hit prohibition, communism, and just overall a quick uh, update on what the politics of the 1920s was kind of like. So prohibition is the big one here. Uh, this is a really fun topic that in normal times we would spend, I usually spend about a week on this and have some movie clips for you. We'd probably have an assignment or two that piggybacks off of it, but right now we're running behind. Uh, so I just really want to give you the information you need that would be like on any quizzes or tests coming up uh, and give you an understanding of this. So we've talked about the 19th Amendment. You should have that in your notes. The 19th Amendment was the Women's Suffrage Amendment where we kind of profiled that in the Iron Jawed Angels movie and saw that struggle and how World War I affected it. At the same time that that amendment was kind of in the works, because remember, an amendment doesn't just happen. You have to get a super majority in both houses of Congress, and then you have to get three quarters of the states to ratify it. So it's a drawn out process. Most of the time when an amendment happens to the Constitution, it doesn't happen in a couple weeks or a couple months. It's a process that takes years for it to plan out. So uh, as women were gaining more uh, kind of rights and we're starting to get the right to vote in different states, a big cause that a lot of women championed or like kind of pushed was to get rid of alcohol. Now, why would women want to get rid of alcohol? Was it that they just wanted to ruin all the fun times for the men and kind of end the party? Not really. Uh, America has a history where we are a <laughs> pretty alcohol friendly nation. Okay. To say it at, at the least. Um, I, Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a French uh, kind of philosopher, had come over, and this is many years before, uh, you know, the 1920s. We're talking like early 1800s. And one of the things he observed when visiting America was he basically said, man, these Americans are drunk all the time. All they do is sit around and drink whiskey and get loaded, you know, and uh, that's saying something coming from a Frenchman because the French have a very strong tradition of, you know, drinking fine wines and uh, are kind of pro booze too. Uh, but I guess America, we just, we were a nation that consumed a ridiculous amount of alcohol. Now that's still kind of true today. Uh, you see beer and liquor commercials on TV all the time and, you know, you're getting bombarded by them. Uh, I would still say we're a pretty alcohol friendly or alcohol accepting nation. Well, <clears throat> why did we think about banning it then? Why did it get banned? It was because <clears throat> you get a lot of collateral damage to, you know, high levels of alcohol consumption. What do I mean by collateral damage? I mean, yeah, it might be fun to party and get drunk and kind of, you know, kick back and it de-stresses you a little bit, but it doesn't really like fix your problems. And there's a lot of like other damage that can happen when say one member of a family is an alcoholic and is getting slammed drunk multiple nights a week. Uh, and a story that played out over and over and over again in American homes was there were drunk dads that would, you know, they'd be working some really long hours on the farm or more and more guys are coming in and working in these dingy, dirty factories, not making a great living. I mean, if you're working for Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford didn't approve of alcohol and he paid very high, but a lot of factories, they could care less if their workers were drinking and they didn't pay nearly as much as Ford. So, you know, Ford was a good factory job, but there were a lot of crappy factory jobs out there. Uh, and think about it. A lot of these guys that are working 10, 12, 14 hour shifts and they just are miserable at their job doing the same thing over and over. Uh, 
once you get out of work, what do you want to do? You want to blow off some steam and you want to go down to the saloon and get drunk. And then after that, you're going home for dinner, but now you're loaded. And, you know, I'm sure some of you have seen this in your lives or in our community, but alcoholism can be a very dangerous and kind of unsettling thing in home life where some of these drunk dads would come home and beat the mom, beat the kids. Uh, And it led to just a lot of disruption in American home life. In addition to that, a lot of these really wealthy, powerful industrialists, guys like Henry Ford or Andrew Carnegie, uh, John Rockefeller, these guys that had a tremendous amount of political pull because of all the, the massive fortunes they had, they didn't generally like it that much because a lot of times if their guys were drinking all the time, well, then they get hung over and they don't report to work the next day and it cuts productivity and it costs them money. Uh, so you had a kind of a weird coalition formed together of these like kind of housewives and women who had, are just now getting the right to vote, who are pretty anti-alcohol. Uh, you have the religious community, a lot of these churches, which America was super religious back at this time, uh, and they're kind of teaching that alcohol is a sin because you do find certain Bible verses that kind of condemn the consumption of alcohol, at least if it's in excess. Um, and you have some of these very wealthy, powerful industrialists that like they know that if alcohol gets banned, it doesn't mean that they can't drink they're going to be just fine. And they've got massive fortunes of billions of dollars. They're going to get any substance they ever want. They just don't want it available to the common man. They don't want their workers coming in uh, drunk and hung over and not doing a good job. So after, I mean, it was controversial, but eventually the 18th Amendment does get ratified and passed around the same time as the 19th Amendment. These two big laws basically go into effect at the same time where Women are now universal, have the same suffrage rights as men, and now, bam, alcohol is banned. Now, another thing that I didn't put up here, but the the 18th Amendment didn't directly like enforce the banning of alcohol. It just made it so that the government could do that. And then there was another law that was passed called the Volstead Act, just a regular act by Congress that enforced all the like the ins and outs of banning it and said what the states and law enforcement could go do. So again. <clears throat> One thing I'd want you to put in here that I have on the notes page, what was the goal of the 18th Amendment? Well, it was essentially to eliminate drunken, drunkenness, to make people like better workers, and then, excuse me, and then also to help out families and to try to like end spousal and child abuse, okay? So it had great intentions, all right? I mean, the alcohol could be a very destructive thing in home life um, and to our workforce, and the thing was, they, they try to ban it and they think that'll fix the problem. But think about human nature. If you're told you can't do something, I mean, think about it. At your age, you guys are told you can't drink. Does that deter lots of kids from going out and having a party or going and drinking? And I'm not accusing anybody of doing it and not looking to name names or anything like that. But we all know like partying happens. And, and part of the appeal to partying for the younger crowd, people in your age is, man, it's taboo. I'm not supposed to do it. I'm getting away with something. I'm being a rebel. Uh, Well, it kind of had the same effect on adults back in this era. Just because the government came in and said, hey, we're going to be your mom and we're not going to let you drink anymore. We're banning this. It really, most people didn't necessarily listen to the government. People are going to do what people want to do. And if they want to drink, they're going to find a way to drink. But now you can't go do it at a local bar or something because they're all going to get shut down all of the you know above board bars that would be advertising and stuff you're not going to be able to go to your local liquor store grocery store market and pick up some beer or uh, wine or alcohol uh, that's all going to be banned. So where are you going to get it? Well, you turn to the black market. It's kind of like how drugs are in America today. Uh, just making heroin or marijuana illegal doesn't really cut down the consumption that much. If people are going to do it, they're going to find a way to do it. But now they just buy it illegally on the black market. So unintended consequences of the Prohibition Amendment. Here are some key things I want you to have. First, it leads to a huge spike, a rise, massive rise in organized crime, uh, because now people don't really stop drinking in any great numbers. They just have to buy it illegally. So this creates a massive black market that the mafia is going to step into. Now, there are a lot of different mafias or mobs uh, operating at the time. You could think of them 
basically as a modern day cartel that's smuggling heroin or cocaine or something into America today, like the big Mexican cartels uh, that you hear about quite a bit in the news and are causing a lot of disruption in, in Mexico, our neighbor to the, the south. Uh, the same thing kind of took place back in this time, except it was the Italian mob and the Irish mob and the, the Russian and Jewish mobs. There were different like ethnic groups that would form together. And it doesn't mean all members of that community. It's not like all Italian people were part of the mob, but there was a very strong Italian mob uh, back at the time and Irish and all the other groups that I listed off to and many more that I didn't even hit there. Uh, probably one of the most notable like mafia crime family syndicates at the time was Al Capone in the Chicago outfit. Uh, Al Capone, who goes down as probably one of the most notorious and famous and successful gangsters in American history, he literally made in today's money, like up in the billions of dollars. And how did he do it? He he was a bootlegger. A bootlegger is somebody that smuggles alcohol illegally. Make sure you have that term in there. Uh, Al Capone, even though he was from New York when he was a young man, he moved to Chicago and he basically kind of through a series of gang wars, takes over like 98% of the, the liquor trade in Chicago, almost locks down the whole darn city. And Chicago is a big, big city where a lot of people there were drinking and he is just making money hand over fist. And how does, he makes money on a variety of things. He's, uh, it's an organized crime family. So he has brothels, like basically prostitution houses, um, racketeering he you know is like holding people you know basically getting money out of people for protection uh he has gambling houses and kind of like little mini casinos but by far the thing he made the most money on was bootlegging whiskey and vodka into chicago and selling it on the black market that was his bread and butter that he made tons of money on and you can find other gangsters that were probably not as successful as al capone but in basically every major american city uh the, you know the the crime families became ruthless because there's a lot of money attached to having some territory or turf where you're gonna sell uh another thing that they would make connections to like think all of the regular legal bars and saloons get shut down when prohibition goes to effect. Uh, but people like to get together and listen to some music. In this case, in the 1920s, they're listening to jazz music. They're, they want to get together and play some cards with their buddies. They want to hang out and, you know, just let loose. I mean, it's bars are big business today. People, Americans, many uh, regularly visit their local watering hole. They go out to a bar and they, you know, kick back with some friends. Well, when all of the bars got banned, I mean, people, there was still a strong market force, like where people wanted to get together and socially drink. So now you have illegal black market bars popping up in cities like Chicago. They'd have been all over on basically every street corner uh, where they're not really a bar, but they're a bar. You know what I mean? You go in and you got to know the little password or whatever, or have some connection that you're cool and you're not one of the cops or something, or you're you know ratting them out and they'd let you come in and they'll sell you booze just like it was pre-prohibition times. And in a lot of ways, people like these speakeasies sometimes even more than the legal bars before prohibition, because it adds that element of I'm doing something taboo. I'm getting away with something. Ooh, I'm being a bad boy, a rebel, or a bad girl. A lot of these flappers would love to go to these speakeasies too. So key terms for you. No, organized crime or the mafia shoots way up. It becomes way more powerful because now they have almost an unlimited source of money that they and revenue that they can tap into by selling illegal liquor. A bootlegger like Al Capone was a bootlegger. Even though he didn't literally go out and do it himself, he had an organization where thousands of people of gangsters worked for him. He and his men were bootleggers. They were, and originally that term comes from, you would stick a flask, a little like bottle, a pint of whiskey in your boot and hide it there so the coppers don't see you. Uh, but then bootlegging, how it's done for like the Chicago outfit and Al Capone, they're literally bringing in boatloads of liquor, barrels of whiskey from Canada where it was still legal. They'd go through the Great Lakes and they'd drop it off in Chicago, or they would take the back roads up through Wisconsin or Michigan uh, and bring truckloads of it in, and then they would distribute it from there. So bootleggers are guys that are smuggling alcohol. Make sure you know that. That'll be an exam question. And then speakeasies are these illegal bars that are operating during the Prohibition era. 
I know too, another key thing. So the 18th Amendment or Prohibition lasts from 1920 to 1933. We'll go over the repeal in the near future in the next week or two. But by the time you get into the 1930s, the depression hits and the good times are done. Uh, the roaring 20s are long over and you know people are bummed out and depressed and a lot of people are unemployed. Uh, probably economically the worst time in American history by far. <clears throat> So eventually, uh, the government decides that, hey, this isn't working, and we repeal the Prohibition Amendment, and we actually pass another amendment saying the 18th Amendment is now null and void, and alcohol is legal again. Uh, next slide for you. Here you go. Let me move myself out of the way. So here's some cops coming in and doing a raid. Now, <clears throat> police officers, I don't want to say all police officers were corrupt, but many, many were back at this time because a lot of police officers drank themselves and they didn't really agree with this law. And they thought, meh, you know, they, it's one of those laws that they're told they have to enforce and they got to do it to get their paycheck. But a lot of these guys, they were morally like, I don't think this is that big a deal. And I don't think the government should step in. Um, and some for no reasons like that. They just knew that these criminals like Al Capone would give them a kickback and give them a bribe and give them some money. And so a lot of police officers, especially in cities like Chicago, were on the take and they would get bribes. And then they wouldn't come and, and raid your liquor warehouse or they let Al Capone and his men, you know, go, go by and keep operating because they were getting kickbacks. And sometimes they were making two or three times what their police officer salary was in order to just look the other way and not disrupt this business. But there were also honest cops out there that did make raids. So you can find countless photos like this of police officers coming in and making a raid for one reason or another. Uh, and you'll see, you know, they have old videos of them dumping all kinds of just barrels of beer and whiskey right down the, the sewers and the drains. Uh, here is next photo. This is like a speakeasy door. You've probably all seen this before on like an episode of, I don't know, some comedy or, a, you know, maybe like an episode of Family Guy or The Simpsons. I've seen it before where they'll have that little slot in the door and it's like you come knock on it and they open it up and you're like, who are you? What's the password? You cool? You know, something like that. And it was like they would have these steel reinforced doors because at these speakeasies, they're operating illegally. So if the police do come make a raid, having a big steel door like that would give them a little time to get out the back exits, take all the cash, take as much of the liquor as they could, get the heck out of there. Um, but usually if the owner of the speakeasy was like basically paying off the cops and the judges and stuff, uh, then they could just kind of keep operating and the police wouldn't mess with them. Uh, but a lot of times, again, like getting back to that feeling like you're doing something bad, you're a rebel and being taboo. A lot of times you'd have to have a password or you'd have to like know the guy to get in uh, because technically you are violating the law. And like a lot of times these speakeasies would get raided and people would get locked up and thrown in jail. Uh, so it definitely happened too. Okay, moving on. Away from uh, prohibition for a minute, I want you to talk, or I want to talk to you about communist activities. Now, in the last unit in World War One, we talked about the Russian Revolution. Uh, that was the first time a major country in the world went over to basically a communist regime. They kind of restructured everything. Remember, they killed the czar and his whole family. And now the communist, this Vladimir Lenin guy, has taken over. And it's like there's been a workers revolution. That's what communism is about. It's like there's no more elite upper class. There's no more rich oil tycoons. There's no more kings or queens. We're getting rid of all of them. And it's like the farmers and the... And the industrial laborers are taking control of all of the means of production. They're going to control the land and the factories. Okay. That's like the, the core, like kind of principle behind like how communism is intended to function. Now, usually communism, communist states, when you look at them throughout history, they become just as corrupt and oppressive as any other king or queen or emperor ever could have been. Uh, they like, Communism has lofty goals that sound really good, but when you put them into practice, they don't work right. Now, America became very paranoid of a communist revolution happening here inside the United States because we saw what happened to Russia during World War I. And Russia didn't like th this revolution took. And there's it's still like the Communist Party under this Lenin guy who's basically a dictator now is running this really big, powerful country. And it makes us worried. We're worried that it's going to spread. It's going to go through Europe. It's going to go through other parts of the world and eventually get to North America. And there truly was because you have the First Amendment in America. 
It's not illegal to be part of any political party you want. You can be, now the communists never had a really high membership here in America. Uh, they've off, like basically always been seen as like kind of the outcasts and the enemies. But even to this day, there still is an active communist party in America. You could go join up and become a member. Uh, well, people become super paranoid in the 1920s. And there's something that, that sweeps the country called the Red Scare. Where this is paranoia. Now, what I want you to take from this, the one word I have on here that's highlighted is, the red part, red scare. I want you to put into your notes that red equals communist or communism. Whenever you hear me in this class use the term, they're a red uh, or say red this or red that. Most all the time, I'm not just talking about the color red. I'm going to be talking about communists because the new Russian flag, all right, after they get rid of the, the emperor, the new communist Soviet Union flag is all red with the big hammer and sickle logo representing the workers uh, and the farmers. So <clears throat> reds, or sometimes they'll say the pinkos or something like that, but the red color, they're supposed to be the communists and a huge scare, a lot of paranoia and anti-immigration sentiment uh, sweeps America in the 1920s. So if you think of like in modern times where we're like, man, we got to build a wall. We need to keep those, you know, outsiders out. We don't want a bunch of refugees coming in here. That's not a new thing. That's happened and it goes up and down and kind of in trends throughout American history. But the 1920s were a very anti-immigrant, anti-communist time in U.S. history. And we felt like a lot of these commies were coming out of places in Europe. So like if you were a Russian immigrant and you might've been communist or not, but you were trying to immigrate into America and have a better life, you probably, your neighbors, when you're moving in, would have looked at you kind of suspicious and thought, mm, I don't know what their political leanings are. Hopefully they're not going to try to start a revolution or, you know, you know, have anarchy and overthrow the government. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of playing out in America at the time. Now, overall, the 1920s are a pretty good decade. That's why they get nicknamed the Roaring Twenties. Things are just kind of running smooth. Stocks are going up. People are making more money. Uh, paychecks are getting bigger. Uh, you know, it was overall a pretty darn good decade for most people in America. You can find exceptions where some certain groups, uh, you know, didn't fare too well. Uh, but as an overall big picture type thing, 1920s, a pretty good kind of a successful decade. So, you know, you go back to the World War I era. Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. He, you know, was kind of through that home stretch of the suffrage amendment, basically through all the 19 teens, the Democrats were in part and were in power. But America is a two party system. And you can track this all the way back through to the days of George Washington till today. And you'll see that in a two party system, from decade to decade, year to year, you, the political pendulum swings back and forth. And you never know quite how long the Republicans will keep power or how soon it'll swing back to the Democrats and how long they'll keep power. But one thing you can be sure of, the power swings back and forth from one party to the other. It just kind of has to function that way in a two-party system. So the 19-teens are a Democrat decade. The 1930s also are going to be a Democrat decade, but the 1920s, kind of the good times, that was an era of Republican dominance. So I'd want you to put that in there, that the 1920s, the Republican Party ends up dominating most American, uh, you know, most of American politics. Uh, and they also, here's the thing I'd want you to throw in here, kind of a vocab term, they practice laissez-faire economics. Now, what the heck is that? That doesn't sound like a word we've probably heard too much before. It's actually a French term, and laissez-faire basically means, to sum it up, the government shouldn't get involved in business. Just let businesses do what they're good at. Let them go make money. So let's keep regulations and taxes low. Let's encourage business and innovation, get people to work. Uh, so it's a really business-friendly time. Now, it all comes off the rails in the late 1920s and 1929 because uh, because there was no regulation and it was low taxes and a pro-business era. Uh, eventually, some people start doing some really shady stuff on the stock market and they start falsely inflating prices so that they can individually make more money. And eventually, the stock market just kind of like implodes. And that's going to lead to the next decade, the 1930s, being just rotten times. So, kind of starting to draw a link there or bridge between these two very different eras in American history, kind of the good times and bad times. All right. Hopefully you got all that. Um, if you got any questions, shoot me an email. I think I highlighted all of the main things I want you to have in your notes. Uh, yep. Don't forget. I'm also posting one other assignment today, so make sure you check my other post as well. See ya.